This is arguably one of the best podcasts I've filmed on this channel thus far and one of the most interesting stories. Muhammad Dawji. We're having a real Forbes list billionaire. $1.8 billion net worth. This is the only time he's ever done a podcast like this. And not many people know this, but he's actually one of the most connected men in the whole world. We trade soft commodities, everything from sugar, rice, fertilizer, from yeast, from tractors to motorcycles. So anything and everything that is not produced in East Africa, I import, I sell. With carbonated drinks alone, I sell over a billion bottles a year. I have one textile factory that can produce 52 million meters of cloth. So I produce cloth in one factory that can go around the whole world. I mean, if you look today, I'm employing 47,000 people. I mean, this is the second largest employment after the government of the United Republic of Tanzania. 99% of the products that are being bought by consumers are my products. What's the most expensive thing you've purchased? It's a football club. Uh, it's called Simba. It's got 35 million fans. I lose about $4 million a year on it and uh, for the last five years I've lost 20 million dollars. I thought you were gonna say a private island. The Zanzibar, so that's where the island is. I have the island in Zanzibar. It's a beautiful island, it's about 350 acres. I'm gonna put up a resort there. I don't know if you know that I've signed the Giving Pledge. The Giving Pledge is an initiative by Gates and Warren Buffett where billionaires give away half of their wealth to philanthropy and we are about 120, 130 billionaires in the world. We meet once in a year, always in the US. How does that kind of meeting look like? Do you have like a group chat of billionaires? So I bought a Bugatti, it's just too fast. So I sold it, <laughs> I sold it off, yeah. I, I think I made 500,000 euros or something. Wow, Yes. I think you're the only person in the world to buy a Bugatti Chiron and make a profit on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> insane. There is cars in this world that are north of 4 million, 5 million. But what's 4 million, 5 million for you? For you, it's like, that's like a day. Like even if you totaled it, it would be like two days and you got to buy it. I move around with police, security, tail cars, six security people full time. But as we know, life isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Tanzanian billionaire Mohamed Doji. He was abducted last week by unknown men. The story of how you got kidnapped. They were behind me in an SUV. So when I parked the car, they came in and they shot a couple of times in the air and they started pointing at me. My father, he went and said it too many times, that please leave my kid. This guy stripped me naked in the car. Five days in and he said, I'm gonna shoot you. And I said, bro, shoot me. Good afternoon and thank you for returning back to the show. The podcast where we discuss business, self-improvement and happiness. Today, we have a guest that's very different to every other guest I've had on this podcast. Our guest today is none other than Muhammad Dawji, one of my role models growing up as a kid, and if I could say, one of my mentors as well. He's here, he's different than any other guest we've had on this channel before. You know, we've had a lot of people who have claimed to be wealthy, millionaires. Some of them have claimed to be billionaires, but this is the first time that I can say we have a hands down Forbes billionaires list 1.8 billion dollar net worth and we're not talking about billionaires that have companies that got funded by some venture capitalists or some hedge funds and they have crazy valuations and it's all on paper we're talking about billion dollars in revenue no vcs no crazy valuations real traditional businesses that have billions and billions of dollars in revenue 47,000 employees 47,000 hundreds of businesses. This is the only time he's ever done a podcast like this, an interview, because the only other time he's done any interviews, it was with CNN or Fox News for a quick 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and big legacy corporations. However, for the first time, he's sitting here with me today, and we're going to extract as much value and lessons as we can from the man. And not many people know this, but he's actually one of the most connected men in the whole world. He's been seen sitting with almost every single president and every head of state out there. To name a few, there's a member from the Saudi royal family, which is the House of Saud, as well as the French president, Macron, as well as the Indian prime minister, as well as almost every single African president that exists. The UK King, King Charles, he's been seen sitting with and conversating with, as well as when it comes to the billionaires list. Well, I mean, they're all one group. As you know, we'll find out in this video. 
if they have like some kind of group chat, but they're all one group, him, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mike Bloomberg, they've all been seen sitting and talking together. He's amassed 4.3 million followers on his Instagram, 2 million on Twitter, 2 million on Facebook, and he has no course to sell you. Although maybe he should. Or maybe this is the free version that you're getting from tuning into this video. You literally cannot enter Tanzania or East Africa without seeing his name. His name is everywhere, from people who have posters on billboards to people who have stickers of his name on their car or wear clothes with his name and his face on it. He is the man of the people. This is mainly due to his philanthropy. To name a few, there's Mo Cola, which is like cola, Mo Matches, Mo Soap, Mo Sugar. I once asked him, Mo, what do you do? And he told me, I sell everything that you use from the moment you wake up till the moment you sleep. He is an icon amongst the people. He's recently bought a carbon fiber blue Bugatti Chiron. And one of the craziest things about this guest, probably the only billionaire, he was kidnapped for nine days. And we're going to find out the whole story about it to the point where at one point he told the kidnapper, just shoot me. Since then, he's moved his whole family to the UAE, of course, the safest country in the world. And yeah, that's basically it. This is one of the craziest podcasts I'm going to do on this channel. I really hope you guys enjoy. Let's get into it. Mo. Thank you so much for joining us today, bro. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So I um, wanted to ask you first then, you know, I know you recently just flew into Dubai. You flew on a private jet, of course. I know you mostly fly with private jets. Um, what's the most expensive thing you've purchased? I think the most expensive uh, purchase of mine is the football club. Uh, it's called Simba. It's got... 35 million fans. Wow. I bought this club uh, about five years ago. Uh, I lose about $4 million a year on it. It's an expensive uh, habit uh, and a hobby. And uh, for the last five years, I've lost $20 million. But uh, I have made the club into a top 10 club in Africa. Wow. Uh, it's a fantastic initiative. It brings a lot of joy to people. Uh, to Africans and and uh, I'm happy. Nice, nice. Yes. I thought you were gonna say it's uh, you know a very fancy car or a jet or actually not many people know this, but he actually owns a private island. Yes. So I can't imagine the club. So I know that the club, although you spend a lot of money on it, yes, it probably does provide you s with some benefits. Do you think that there's there is some kind of profit that comes out of owning the club because of brand awareness or? Does that, think I, that I think, you know, for now, I think uh, Africa is really behind the curve compared to the world footballing uh, nations. Uh, I think it's a matter of time that the footballing uh, in Africa will catch up with the world. But for now, in the near future, I foresee losing more and more money. But uh, I hope to invest in the youth, develop an academy, and maybe in the future, uh, let's hope something comes out of it. Currently, yes, I do advertise my products through the club, uh, but all in all, it's still an expensive hobby and I'm losing money. And what's your main driving force behind the club? Is it because you're trying to empower the youth or what is the main driving force of so the it's club? It's funny, I used to love Simba when I used to be a young boy. I remember I did not have the money to go and buy tickets to go wow. watch the game. I had to uh, sit on public transport and ask someone to help me to get into the game. So I, I love the club since I was a young boy. Yeah. And when I grew up, uh, about 10 years ago, I was doing a very similar interview, not a podcast. And somebody asked me that, so what is your position on Simba? And I told them that, look, I'm ready to buy it for X, Y, Z amount of dollars and I'm ready to invest. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, it was not possible because it was, it's like a Barcelona yeah. and Real Madrid owned by so many members. And in the end, they all agreed, you know, and uh, so I went ahead with the transaction. But uh, all in all, at least we are in a happier space and yeah. the, the fans are happy. Yeah. Nice. Wow. That's a crazy story. <coughs> yes. Just from a small interview and it ended yes. up happening. Yes. So you talked about how when you were a small boy and yes. about how you had to go on public transport for the tickets. Yes. Actually, maybe we should start by this. Maybe if I could ask you to give a quick brief uh, for yes. those who don't know in, your, in the audience, yes. a quick, let's say, 30 to 90 seconds. Yes. A summary of your life story. Yeah. I know it's quite hard to sum it up. But. That's fine. I was born in uh, central Tanzania in a small town called Singida. I actually didn't make it to the hospital, so not many people know about that. I was born at home with a midwife, 
and I had an umbilical cord around me. At oh, that yeah. time, there was no ultrasound, so nobody knew there was a problem. My mom went through 16 hours of labor pain, wow. and in the end, they thought that they were going to lose the child or the mother. Uh, and uh, with Allah's grace, I was born alive at home. Uh, so that's how I started, you know. And uh, I grew up and went to school in northern Tanzania and went to International School of Tanganyika. I ended up at Georgetown, uh, majored in finance and international business and minored uh, in theology. Uh, I had a small stint at, the, at Wall Street. And then I went back and joined uh, my father's business uh, in the late 1990s. And from there on, I kind of excelled into uh, expanding the business. It's very nice to you. You mentioned that it was his business, and I know that for sure the amount you grew it, like from a normal, regular business to where it is now, is yes. is a massive change, you know. And I remembered that I really wanted to be a rich man, and at that time, per capita income was very low in Africa. The population was smaller, and I said that how do I become a rich man? in a country or countries where there's a lot of poverty. Mm. So I decided to follow the money. Mm. Uh, and I said, okay, whatever the small amount of money people have, where do they spend that mm. money on? And the answer was food, the fast mm. moving consumables. And thus uh, I, I did uh, invest further in those sectors. And fast forward now, we uh, close to about $3 billion of revenue and uh, employing now almost 46, 47,000 people. Wow. Yes. That's insane. It's a crazy story. Do you think that for someone who comes from, let's say, poverty, Yes. Um, this is an interesting question. Do you think it's easier or harder to become successful when you have, so obviously when you have nothing, when you have absolutely zero, let's say your poverty, you have a lot of motivation right. to make a lot of money. Right. But what usually happens is when kids are born into families that like, already there's like not poverty when they're comfortable and middle class, there's usually less motivation for them to make it in life. What do you think is harder? Yes, if, if you go through a difficult environment, of course you have appetite, you want to work hard. At the same time, uh, when you have grown up with a lot of wealth around, that ambition kind of dissolves. Of and you gotta just work very hard, and this is something that I'm trying very hard with my children, uh, for them to have appetite, to be disciplined, to work hard, to be able to get uh, where they want to get. Yes. But all in all, I think that I, I've worked really, really hard throughout my life. I mean, there were years, for many, many years, I used to work 100-hour weeks. Wow. And I, would, I used to sleep in, 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 the, in, the, in the office, and I would get up and just change my shirt and tie and continue the day. There was no Sundays. There was no holidays. We were just working the whole time. Wow. Yes. That's unbelievable. It's this, the journey, it, I think there's definitely beauty in the struggle. And I want to ask you, all that hard work, what was driving you? What was your driving force? So obviously... You know, it was not like that you were just trying to like feed yourself. So what was that driving force for you to become that successful? Did you set out on becoming a billionaire? Like you were like, I want to be a billionaire. What was that driving force? A, a I always wanted to uh, be a successful uh, person. And two, of course, a lot of people in the world uh, attach success to money, uh, which sometimes I find it difficult uh, to reason with. Uh, but yes, I wanted to be a successful and I wanted to be a wealthy person. But I also was making sure that whatever I, I invested in had a lot of impact. And one of the areas was uh, employment. Mm. I mean, if you look today, I'm employing 47,000 people. Great. I mean, this is probably the second largest employment after the government of the United Republic of Tanzania. So mm. I invest in businesses where I know for a fact that I can employ a lot of people, mm. I can give livelihood to a lot of people. Yeah. At the same time, I make money. So I do more of an impact investment, mm. uh, unlike some others who just want to make a quick buck and, and out of it. Yeah. 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 No, that's well. So um, I wanted to ask you, you know, we mentioned some of the presidents uh, earlier and how have you become so connected? Like, it's not something, I know that you're running like, you know, 50 businesses, managing 47,000 employees. How have you managed to become so connected with like every president, every set of, every head of state? 
You know, with, with God's grace, uh, since young, I have been winning accolades uh, all across the continent of being the best entrepreneur or the youngest entrepreneur or the, you know, I won uh, to become a Forbes person of the year in 2015. I was on the cover of Forbes uh, much earlier than that. And therefore, I, I, I try to intermingle with heads of state because I... I'm not just offering investment, I'm offering a lot of advice, and I am a big believer uh, for Africa. I think Africa, you know, if you look at Africa, you're talking about a 3.6 trillion uh, GDP, and you have 1.3 billion people, but that's a little distorting. If you take out Nigeria and South Africa and Morocco and Algeria, uh, then you have an Africa with a per capita income of 1,000, to twelve hundred dollars uh, a year. A that year. Means, yes, that means hundred dollars a month. And when wow. you talk about hundred dollars a month, that's very little money. Just recently, with the Ukraine-Russia war, uh, prices of commodities doubled, of fuel, of fertilizer, of grain, of edible oils. So, out of that hundred dollars that an African have, they spend seventy dollars in food. And now, if food prices have doubled, so ideally they can just buy $35 worth of food uh, to feed their family, which is not possible. And that is where you go into uh, malnutrition and stunting, etc. So I try to advise uh, governments and heads of state. I sit uh, in the advisory board of Cyril Ramaphosa, who's the president of South Africa. We just try to advise to make sure that how do we have resilient economies where we create tons of jobs mm. and give social services to people. You know, I think this is what our aim, ultimate aim as African is. Nice, nice. Yes. That's unbelievable. So when you when you meet like these presidents and stuff, basically you're, you're basically like a man of value. They understand yes. like when they sit with you, you provide them the value of showing them what kind of investment opportunities there are in Africa. For is sure. that what it is? For sure, yes. And I, 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 of course, I tell them that I want to invest in their countries. I want to employ uh, people. I will pay taxes. So it's a win-win win -win for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's a win-win for me. It's a win-win for them. Or there are certain areas where I ask them to tweak policies mm -hmm. to make sure that the environment for investment is better. Like, look at it in the UAE. Everything is open for business. Yeah. They create such a conducive environment for people to just come in and invest. So similarly with Africa, we do that, yes. yes. Nice. Do you think that in today's world, like, I know there's so much opportunity in yes. Africa. Yes. Still today. Yes. Do you think in today's world, it's easier to open a business in a country or, like, to be a, open a successful business? In a, com in a country like, let's say, UAE or USA or UK, as opposed to Africa? Or do you think it's easier to be successful in Africa as maybe it's less saturated, less competitive? Or so I think it's easier to do business in the West or the Middle East in terms of, you know, everything else. Opening business, conducive environment, tax environment, people. Uh, in Africa, it's difficult but then again, it has its advantages that you have less competition, you have a growing market. I mean, you have over 50% of the population of over 1 billion people that are less the age of 18. Wow. So there's a huge market in front of you, less competitiveness. And yes, there is, there's challenges in terms of capital, but if you do have capital, then I think that it's very easy to make money in Africa. Mm. Yes. Nice. Very, Even very like young entrepreneurs. I know that the, the guy who invented Bolt, they say he's the, one of the youngest billionaires in the world. Yes. He went first to Africa Correct. to try to make his market there. Yeah, so when I went back, you know, from Georgetown, when I graduated, when I went back, um, uh, my father used to do a commodity trades business. Yeah. He used to do import and export. Let me give you a little bit of detail on sure. what we do now. Uh, so A, we have one silo, we trade. We trade soft commodities, everything from sugar, rice, fertilizer, from bubble gum to yeast, from tractors to motorcycles, from air conditioners to fans. So anything and everything that is not produced in East Africa, I import, I sell. Mm. At the same time, Africa has got big in agri agriculture. So I export coffee beans, cocoa, sesame seed, yellow gram, pigeon peas, green moon, gum arabica, beeswax, 
cotton. So anything and everything that you find in Uganda, in Malawi, in Zambia, corn uh, in Tanzania, I buy and I export. Yeah. So this is the first silo that I work in. It's like a Cargill or a Dreyfus or an ADM. It's a commodity trade house. Number two, I went into manufacturing. So I compete with Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola. Uh, I'm into the edible oil, so I do edible oil refining, cooking fats, margarines, soaps. I do grain milling, wheat milling, maize milling, rice milling. I do plastics, PET, HDP, LDP, water, juices, carbonated drinks. With carbonated drinks alone, I sell over a billion bottles uh, a wow. year. Yes, I'm into textiles. And textiles, I do ginning, I do spinning. Spinning is to make it into yarn. I weave into cloth. I mercerize, I dye. I print, I knit, and I garment. I mean, I have one textile factory that can produce 52 million meters of cloth. 52 million, let me put it in a context, it's 52,000 kilometers wow. of cloth. I mean, the whole world is 48,000 kilometers. So I produce cloth in one factory that can go around the whole world. So I'm into a lot of fast-moving consumable manufacturing industries. That is, so a lot of industries, that's number two. Number three, I'm into distribution and logistics. So I have clearing and forwarding. I have my own dry ports, internal container depots. I have my own vehicles, logistics, warehousing, ICT infrastructure. So what happens, I distribute my goods all over the hinterland, all over the country. So what happens when a farmer comes, he wants to sell me anything. He wants to sell me corn or cashew nuts. I'll buy it, right? I give him the money. What does he do with the money? He wants to buy sugar and rice and flour, sell which that. I sell back. So the, the depth of the distribution is unreal. Then I'm into insurance. I'm into microfinance, mobile telephony. So all in all, the company, I'm into petroleum business. So it is very, very diversified. And like you rightly say, that the time you wake up in the morning, uh, the person uses toothpaste uh, to brush his teeth or he has a torch and he wants to use the Mo Simba battery in it or in the morning he eats a chapati which is made out of flour or the tea which is coming out of my gardens or the sugar that he uses or the edible oil he cooks in or the bicycle he uses to go or the clothing that he wears. So METL group or the Mo product touches the lives of people on day-to-day -day basis. And what we try to do is we give them the best quality pr product possible at the cheapest price possible. Wow. Yeah, so that is the vision, is making sure that we produce and be very, very competitive. And that is why we have won the Unilever, the Procter & Gamble. So if you come to East Africa, you find their products like Tide, or Omo yeah. in just supermarkets. Yeah. Otherwise, 99% of the products that are being bought by consumers are my products. Mm. Yes. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And they never compete with you on the price? No, no. You see, because we, we undercut them on price. So they sell a, a Coke of, let's say, 300 ml. I would sell my Mo Extra at 400 ml. I mean, give 400 ml at the same price. Now, I don't have to pay cost for syrup, or I don't have to pay franchisee costs, etc., etc. So I become more and more competitive. And I guess the more businesses you own, yes. the stronger the brand name gets. And I feel like when people are familiar, like if they already feel safe when they buy their Mocola, yes. then when they go buy their sugar, they're like, okay, the Mo brand is always safe. Perfect. It's always reliable. It always gives them what they need. It never... It never cheats them. It never pinch. It cuts costs. You know, hundred percent. Never. Uh, so it's it's, it's something very interesting that you have said. So I can produce anything. So tomorrow, if I start producing ice creams and I put more ice cream, I don't have to advertise because day one people will look at more and they say, okay, we know this product and they'll start eating the ice cream. Yes. And it's all. Is it all like named after your name, Mohammed? No. So it's funny that we used to have many many brands. Okay. You know, we used to have like. 80 brands. Yeah, sure. And my younger brother, Hussein, he is the sales and marketing director. So he comes to me, Mo, you know, we got to have, you know, I don't know how many millions of dollars of advertising budget. And I'm like, listen, man, I don't have this kind of money to carry all these brands. So I told him that, Hussein, why don't we come up with one brand that is it's very easy to pronounce, yeah. 
it doesn't have to mean anything. And I said, look, Nike or Puma, it doesn't have to mean anything. So but it should be easy to pronounce. One syllable. Yes, and for Africans, it should be easy to pronounce. Then he went quiet and then I told him, okay, because in, in the US, Mohammed became Mo. And I said, look, why don't we do Mo? It's easy. But I didn't want to, you know, kind Try of push, push it on to him yeah. because at the end of the day, he was the one who had to sell all the products. <laughs> and I was worried that if he doesn't sell, he'll say that, look, you know, you pushed me to a... So he waited for, I think, three, four months and he said, okay, no, no, we go with the Mo product and uh, the Mo brand. And now we are all across, you know. We still have very some solid, strong brands, other brands, and then we plug a more on top of it and yeah. then slowly slowly the more becomes dominant wow yes so i have to ask you then yes you know in the west they say everything about like for example having having you know focusing on one business or at maximum two things you know yes and I, you know people they think elon musk is doing a lot with like a few different businesses which he had mm. but w what's your opinion on like as, as an entrepreneur is it better to focus and you know try to do one thing very well or is it better to just to just keep trying to make as many sources of income as you can so ideally if you're in an economy that is large enough like the u.s then you can just do one thing and become elon musk mm -hmm. yeah or two things yeah. when you become a centi-billionaire right but when you look at east africa where the gdp of economies are 40 billion 50 billion you can't just do one business. So if you do a water and carbonated drinks business, you'll get to a point of saturation and you're not going to reach your billion. Mm. So because the economy sizes are small, you got to end up doing so many businesses. So I'll give you a small example. Yeah. I'm into the edible oil business and I realize I need packaging into jerry cans, into buckets. Yeah, so I go and manufacture plastics, right? <laughs> if I'm into the soap business, you need packaging of boxes and corrugated boxes. I go into corrugated boxes. In the milling, I need flour, I need polypropylene bags. So this make that. Manufacture that, and you know. You have, a, you have a big customer already, which is yourself. Already, already. So there's a lot of captive consumption. So to answer your question, it is easier to do one business in a large economy and to focus on it rather than to do what I'm doing. But in Africa, you don't have much of a choice. You have to diversify. If you want to make it. Yes. If you want to really yes. make it. At least the size people. that we are looking at, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. To employ that many people and to help yes. make as much yes. difference in society. Yes, correct. Very, very interesting. But then how do you manage your time? So, like, we only, you only have 24 hours in the day. It's crazy, bro. And <laughs> you have, like, hundreds of businesses. Yeah, you can't crazy. even spend one hour. Even if you work 24 hours a day, you can't even spend one hour on one business. It's crazy. So, so what I you're, do... You're doing by the microsecond, like, 30 yeah. seconds on this business, 30 seconds. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting question. So I'll tell you something. I, if I just blink and I have a daughter who's now 20, I've missed her. And this is my regret, you know. I've missed her and whole, you know, growing up, you know. I mean, I've been working like crazy. So what I do is I wake up at five in the morning and it's funny, I got kidnapped at five in the morning yeah. at, the gym, at the gym and we'll talk about that. But um, I go out and run 10K wow. uh, every, and morning. every morning. And I, at six o'clock, I come home, quickly shower and just go to the office. And then I have thousands of emails and then there I have assistants. So I have like 15 assistants. There's someone that will respond to my emails, but then there are certain reports of commodities that I need to read myself. And then there are certain emails that I need to respond to myself. So by the time it is 7.30, to a large extent, I've already given trouble to all my employees by sending them crazy amounts of emails and a lot of questions and read through all my reports. 7.30 sharp, I start my board meetings. And usually I run three board meetings in a day. When, 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 and the board meeting is, is very concise. It, we run cash flows, we run P&Ls, we run budgets. But we talk about internal audit, strategy, and so on. So, so can forth. you describe, like, in the boardroom, sorry to interrupt you, but, yeah. like, so in the boardroom you have all the directors of, yes. each, of each... Each and every company. So each and every company has its own CEO, okay. CFO, blah, blah, blah. So all those professionals come in, we run through the numbers, we run through they the make, strategy. They, they present to you, basically. Yes, yes. And okay. I sit down as a chair and we, 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 we strategize and three times a day for two, three hours, depending on the size of the business, some businesses are bigger, They'll take longer, some are smaller, and take shorter. So I try to run about three of them in a day. Uh, and uh, 
once I, I'm done with that, and then in between the afternoon, then I have a lot of guests. So whether it may be my bankers, whether it be fellow entrepreneurs, and then the evenings, I'll probably be invited somewhere. So by the time I get home, it'll be like midnight, you know? And uh, so it's long days, and uh, then I, by the time I wind down, I sleep, I was sleeping for three, four hours a day, and I'll wake up in the morning and the same thing would start, including Sunday and Monday, and it was just sometimes I would lose track Saturday, what day it was. No weekend, no nothing. Yeah, completely. I sacrificed uh, a Very lot good. in my life, yeah, to get to where I am. Uh, am I proud of that? I'm not sure. I should have done that. Will I do that again? I don't think I would. Uh, wow. But uh, That's Yes, because That's bygones are bygones. Is maybe at that time I didn't think of anything better, uh, but now that when I look at my kids and they've grown up, I, I would not want to do that for the rest of my life. I would rather spend more time with my kids than to accumulate wealth. Mm. Yeah. Damn, that's interesting, man. Yes. Yes. Uh, but you are happy as an individual. I remember I asked you one time, are you happy? And you told me, yeah. No, alhamdulillah, I'm very happy. I think moving to the United Arab Emirates has been good for me. I think uh, I'm at peace. I, I play more golf. I spend more time with my kids. I spend more time with my wife, which is uh, amazing, uh, which I, 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 I wouldn't do otherwise. And then I keep on going to Africa and Asia and Europe and the U.S., once in a month, and the other time is I'm in good space. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy. Do you think that money buys happiness or not? I think at, when you reach your stage, you're the only one who can answer this question because some people, I've seen some people say that don't tell me money doesn't buy happiness until you have enough of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So now you can answer yeah. the when, question when you, when, when you are young, you always feel that money uh, gives you happiness or buys happiness. Uh, it may be true. Uh, for some reason or the other. But I think the ultimate happiness does not come out of money. Uh, because you can have 1 billion and you'd want 2 billion and you want 100 billion and 200 billion. That's number one. So your needs never end. Your greed never ends. Uh, if you're not happy with 10 million in your account, then you're never going to be happy. Uh, that's number two. So I think that when you are younger, yes, you aspire to be someone, you aspire to own things, to have a better life. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I think money is important. I think money is important to be able to invest in your children and their education and to give them a better life. Some of us went through a lot of difficulty in life. I mean, I've gone hungry to bed not because we were poor, it's because my grandmother was a very strict woman, that if you didn't eat at the right time, you would not get food. Wow. Uh, I mean, I have been whacked when I was young. I've been whacked by my teacher in madrasa, I've been whacked in my it's teachers in too. school, I've been whacked uh, with, with kids that were trying to bully me, I've been whacked by everybody, you know? <laughs> uh, do I whack my children? No, I don't, because I just don't feel right. But I, I, I'm sure that they were trying to be the best they could in trying to raising me. Of and course. maybe I've turned out to be good because of the whacking that I've got, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but would I whack my kids? No. So coming back to your question. It's, it's time changes as well. It's like yes, a time thing. For sure, Society. for sure, for sure. And I think, that, um, I, I think that money is important. But most importantly that, you know, if Allah you know, gives you wealth, uh, then, you know, don't increase your standard of living, you increase your standard of giving. And I think mm. it's very, very important that you need to give back. So we, we have to, we, you know, we've talked about so many different yes, things. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people who watch this video probably thought the kidnapping would be the most interesting. Yes. But like learning what we just learned, I mean, there's so many interesting things to do about you. But I do want to highlight this moment. I want to know the story because you just mentioned we don't have too much time left the story of how you got kidnapped, which is like probably one of the only billionaires in the world, like public bil Forbes billionaires to ever be kidnapped. Can you tell me the story from A to Z, exactly what happened? So, so as for many, many years, I had a regimen that I would wake up and go to the gym at five in the morning. And that the gym would open at five. 
Now, you know, prayer time depends. Sometimes it's 4.50, sometimes yes. 5.15. I would rather pray and leave mm. because when I come back, it's kada already. Yeah, true. So it's that ridiculous. time, the prayer time was 5.05, 5.10. I prayed, I woke up my kids, and it's the only time I was driving at that time. So I never had any security or security detail. Really, yeah? No, never, never, never. So I used to, yeah, I used to walk around, say hi to people. Tanzanians are very friendly people. Or East Africans are very friendly people. So it was the only time I drove, and I have this Range Rover. I was driving with the Mo number plate on yeah, it. Yeah, everyone knows you. They say so, hi. Yeah, so it seems like somebody somewhere was tagging me, you know. And I got out. It's a seven-minute ride. I, I I drove into the gym. It's the Colosseum gym. They were so nice. So there's an owner's parking at the at the main gate, right. and so the guy always blocks it for me and then when I come there he takes it out because the owner himself is not there at five in the morning yeah. and I would park there and I parked exactly and there was a car behind me I thought you know it's already 5 15 people are, must be coming in already and I closed the door and there are three people jumped out they had an, they were behind me in an SUV so when I parked the car they came in and they shot a couple of times in the air and they were wearing masks they shot the gun she hide the gun da, da, da. 5 15 and this is, you know, it's uh, never heard of in Tanzania. And they started pointing at me. So the first thing that came in my mind, I thought that these guys, I don't want my car or something. So the first thing I did was slept on the floor, right? I mean, what would you do, oh, right? No. You sleep on the take floor. Guns on the floor. No, no, yeah. yeah. So anyone with their guns, take, you take, sleep on yeah, the floor, take, right? Take the car, take everything. So those guys, they came to me, they took me, bro. They took me and they just shoved me in the SUV. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. And then I'm like, dude, this is real now, you know, because now these guys don't want a car. They, they're they putting me in an SUV and suddenly we, we, we come they out. They blindfolded you at that point? Hmm? At that point, were you blindfolded? No, no. So, so they did what was they put a pillowcase on uh, me. Could you and breathe and properly? They shoved. No, I couldn't breathe. So they shoved me inside the SUV and then... They started arguing with, because, you know, the, the, the gate was locked going out, right? Yeah. And they showed a gun to that guy. They were going to shoot you, man. Then the guys opened the gun. And it, the next 15, 20 minutes, dude, it was terrible. Because this guy stripped me naked in the car. Full naked. Yeah, because they naked. thought that I had some type tracker, of... A, tracker, mic, something. And they kept on asking me about a tracker. And I'm like, dude, man, I have no tracker. And I had a Fitbit. And they threw everything. And oh, my God. And then they, they that basically, they stripped me completely in the plane and they kept on putting guns in my head and we were going to shoot you. It was very violent. Very, very violent. Damn. Uh, those 15, 20 minutes, suddenly... They were the worst 15, 20 minutes of your life? Crazy, crazy. I didn't know what was going What, what was happening, why it was happening. <laughs> I have, like, no clue because, I you know... I know a lot, but it's so... It's, I can't imagine, I like, know. It's terrible. And when I got there... I'm confused. You thought it's like a prank? Do you ever think no, 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 I never, no, no, because at that level, because when I saw those guns, that was real. I mean, the reality hit me while I was in the car, while they were manhandling me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew that, look here, there's no more, there's no nothing, these guys are crazy people, and so on and so forth. We got home, and I had a pillow case on me, and I could see that I'm being taken into a house. But where is this house? What and the, we went in and how far was it from the maybe 20 minutes 25 minutes but I had lost a sense of time Already. whatsoever and we walked in and then what they started doing is now because the the pillowcase was transparent they started using metal tapes to to tie right you know those metal tapes they use to close people's hands yes, and so yes, on so. Yes, yes. so they started putting the metal tape and and they closed it That's so heavy, hard huh? oh yeah yeah and I was telling them my head's hurting, I can't breathe. I started arguing with and them. And you're still naked? No, no. So they gave me a cloth. Okay, okay, okay. It was a cloth. It was like a, in Kiswahili, it's an African print. It was but a tanga or a okay, kitenge, yeah, yeah. like Masai, a lungi Masai, or whatever. Masai, yeah. And I put it on and then they pushed me down and there was a, a mattress down uh, on the floor. And uh, then I get a call and they wanted money, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I'm incapacitated here. Why don't you look for my family? And that was the only call that I received the whole time. You got a call, like a phone call? Phone call. From someone who wanted money. And that, that was the guy who, who kidnapped Somehow, you Somehow, supposedly. But fast forward, in the end, they left me without a dollar. There was no transaction. 
I'm not. Continue, continue what happened. Yeah. So, so when I was there, boss, so nine days, so they tied my legs with this metal tapes. Wow. They tied my hands and not in front. They tied me at the back. So you had your hands tied at the back. Yeah. Boss, the difference between getting tied at the back and the front, it's a lot of money. Because you can't sit. You can't sleep. You can't, you can't sleep. do anything. At can't night, anything. I would sleep. And first it was hot. There were two, three guys sleeping with me. The room was small. Uh, there was no AC. Were they still hitting you? They were hitting me. They were hitting me. They were manhandling me. And then there was a wall on the side. I'd lost the space, the time. I lost all the sense of space and time. And I would light, hit my head light. into the wall. And I, it was, it was, I thought I was going blind. I tried to keep sanity in terms of what day it was. With it. And there was a prayer. There was a mosque. So the adhan would come and I knew wow. that Mashallah. it was. And all I was doing is just praying, boss. I, I knew my life had come to an end. I knew I would not come out of this uh, safely. And all I was doing was doing istighfar. I was praying to God. Seeking I was repentance. asking for forgiveness. And... Uh, Every time I kept on thinking about my family, I would cry. And it How was you use the toilet? No, so for, you know, the day before I had fasted. Okay. So nine days I didn't go to the bathroom. What? I'm telling you. Nine days. But what about because I, I didn't eat. No, so, so the peeing, they would take me and I would stand. And I don't know where I, where I would be peeing, you know. But All over yourself probably. I, no, 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 no. I, it would be, I mean, they would take me to a bathroom. Okay. There was a bathroom, okay, okay. you know. And, and, and they were mad, these guys. I think they were intoxicated. Maybe uh, they were a little drugged up. Yeah, Maybe for sure, they because they're doing such and, inhumane stuff. Yeah, yeah. Alcohol. So they would keep on, you know, putting guns in my head. They would keep on hitting me. They would force me to eat. And I would tell them, look, it's not that I'm not hungry. It's just I'm in a shock. You can't eat, yeah. You know, I just can't eat. And they would force me to eat. Because they thought you were trying to suicide. Something like that, you know. And, uh, you know, and uh, it got to a point, and I, I think it's something that you asked that, you know, I think five days into this whole up and down and manhandling, and they kept on saying, well, I'm going to shoot you, and I'm going to shoot you, and I was done by that time. I think five days of not knowing what was going to happen, uh, not seeing light end of the tunnel, and I was, I couldn't, you know, when you can't see, bro, for one hour you go mad. Even if I tell you here you're sitting in a safe place, you can't see, you'll go crazy. Imagine that you are somewhere you don't even know where you are. And, you know, and, and they're like, they kept on threatening me. I'll kill you and I'll kill you and I'll shoot you and I'll shoot you. Man had you, pushing you. Yeah, and, you. and, you know, I think five days in and he said, I'm going to shoot you. And I said, bro, shoot me, man. Let's close this. Let's finish this. I'm at peace. I've already done my istighfar. I've, you know, killed me. Let's close it. And then they hit me and then left me go. So all in all, it was a very difficult time, man, nine days. And let me tell you something. So a little bit of story. My wife, you know, every time in Tanzania, I buy 15 newspapers. Okay. There are seven newspapers. There are English newspapers. There's five Kiswahili newspapers. There are sports newspapers. There are tabloids and so on and so forth. And you know what happens. When some big news happen, you're in the front page. Second day, you're in the second page. And third day, you're in the third page. And five, fifth day, you're lost. Mm. My wife kept these newspapers. Every single day they were coming and delivering and she kept them for About me. Modoji. So every single day I was on the front page of every newspaper. Mm. Day one, day two, day three. And you know what touched my heart the most? Is poor of the poorest people are praying for me. Where have you seen, seen a rich man getting kidnapped and poor people praying for him? And they usually have these are sometimes. poor African people. The women would come out and say that more has come out of my stomach and that I pray. The Christians, the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Protestants, the Muslims, everybody was just praying for me and praying for me. And at a time, Protesting you even. yes, at a time where it was difficult to speak out because the environment was difficult at that time. Uh, we had some uh, elections. No, no, we had a little bit of a crazy leadership at that time. So, so people were scared to speak. But I'll tell you something, these Tanzanians and the poor people, they prayed for me. Man. They don't you know? care. They, they prayed for me. 
and you know in the end you know I mean they didn't care about the the harms the yes, repercussions yes and and I, in the end I thought they were going to take that in the end nine days later the weekend would come and I would sob I would sob because I knew that these guys want money and uh, there will be no movement of money or the banks will be closed and so on and so forth. So I'm like, shit, man, I'm going to be here for two. So in the end, while I was losing hope, I still had hope. You know, Allah instills hope in people that, no, 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 maybe something's going to happen. Maybe, you know, I started hearing, you know, choppers. And there were no choppers, bro. But that was like, you were trying to get a sign. You know, I, 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 I was telling my wife later that I was here. Why are you guys looking for me with choppers and so on and so People forth? People saying your name. Yes, you know, I couldn't hear names, but I could hear the choppers. And then I was telling those guys that, look, the police is going to come here. If they come here, you're going to die. We're going to, I'm going to die. We're all going to die. Dude. Yeah. You know, why, why aren't you guys thinking about something? In the end, nine days later, something happens. They're like, okay, now we're going to take you back. So I'm like, what do you mean take me? So he's like, no, no, we're going to leave you. So I'm like, really? I was like, no, I, I didn't believe it. Yeah, I'm like, it listen, I knew that there was no money that was being paid to them. I knew that for sure because I asked them to look for my family members. My family members money. will ask for proof of life yeah. that, okay, so more is call there. You. Yeah, either speak, okay, if they, they, they say refuse, speak, okay, they'll say that, okay, more, when, what were you doing on a Friday at three o'clock in Dubai? So if it was you, then I can tell you I was interviewing with you, right? For yeah. example, right? So when they were leaving me, I knew they had no money in their pockets. Who would leave you for free? Yeah, a billionaire. Right? Yeah. It's a question mark, yeah. right? So I knew they were going to kill me. <laughs> so imagine that car that they'd taken, they turned the car off. I get into the car. They start to turn on the car. <laughs> the car doesn't turn on, dude. And I'm like, shit, man, what the hell? This finally, guys, they want to leave me. So I still have some hope that they're going to leave me. At the same time, I'm thinking you know, they're going to go and kill me. At the same time, I want the car to turn on, you know, and the car wasn't turning on. And then there was a problem because, you know, the battery had died. Oh and then God. they took me back inside. Oh, no. And then after that, so they're telling me, okay, now, you know, we need to. So I, they, they took my pillow out and they put a gun on my head. And they said, if you see, we'll shoot you. I was like, okay, no problem. I'm like, I thought you were going to leave me. He's yeah. like, yes, but we're still going to have to cover you. So they put a Band-Aid, which I'll tell you later why they put the Band-Aid. And then they opened my hands, they opened my legs, and they, I wear like a lungi. I wore like a lungi, yeah, because they were trying to dress me like a Maasai initially. And I was like, no, 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 they're just wearing like a towel, yeah. you know. And then they cut my hands at the back, and I, they, they tied me in front with a Band-Aid. Uh, no, no, at, actually at the back with the bandit. And then we, we went, we went on, and then finally the car turned on. I, we started going. Now, there was one guy who was a Christian guy. At the, he was sitting at the back. One kidnapper. Me. Yes, the kidnapper. And same How way. How many guys was it total? I think there were four of them. Because there was one guy who was driving. One guy I knew for a fact was a courier. He's the guy who used to go and buy food or used to buy cigarettes or buy whatever and come and knock on delivery the door. Boy. Yeah, he's a delivery boy. But I'm sure he was in the racket also. One had to be a security outside mm. to make sure if somebody watch. comes in or whatever. And two of them or three of them were inside with me. Now, I could manage the, the two, you know, from senses and so on and so forth. So we get into the car, so I'm shoved back again in the same car at the back. You're praying the car turns on. Yeah, and, and, and I'm holding the guy's hand. And I'm like, you know, I'm holding him like this. Suddenly, I'm smelling a lot of fuel in the car. Oh, no. A lot of fuel. And You're still holding his hand. Yeah, I'm holding his hand. And the guy who's driving the car, I'm still blindfolded. I'm trying to hear the guys turning on the matches. Oh, no. You know, now I didn't know he was trying to turn on the matches to do what. To die. And I presumed that he was trying to smoke. So I'm telling I the guy. I thought car on fire. No, no. So I'm telling the guy, dude, there's a lot of fuel here, bro. Yeah. The car is going to burst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so the guy's like, you shut up, you know. Yeah. And then we started driving, bro. We drove, we drove, we drove. And I'm still not sure what's happening. Suddenly, we get to the po a point where the guy's like, you know, he held my hand. He's like, okay, man, we have reached. And he pushes me. And he pushes me out of the door. And I get out. And I hear the car 
buzz for the next few minutes. It was two in the morning. And then now I realize why they, they changed my, 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 the clothing they used to, because now they use the Band-Aid. So the Band-Aid, it took me just one minute to get off, mm. right? And by the way, I just forgot to tell you, I was arguing with them. Then why are you guys closing me at the back? Yeah. Close me in the front. Yeah. They're like, no, 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 you go to the gym, you can overpower us, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what the hell, man? I'm like, you guys have got guns here, you've got you <laughs> know, knives I, yeah. here. I'm you mad, man? Why would I ever do that? And why would I want to see you, right? Yeah. So anyway, to cut the story short, then I unplugged myself immediately. I took out, and actually I was dropped off on a golf course. So there's a big road in between of the golf course. And I was young, playing golf there all my life. Mm -hmm. It's some place where I could have never got lost. You know, at the back of your hand. But bro, it took me five minutes. I was so disoriented. I thought I was in some jungle somewhere. Then I realized, oh my God, this is a golf course. Then I realized, oh, the embassy of Denmark is behind me. Uh -huh. Then I'm like, okay. And I saw the embassy and I saw a security guy. They was falling asleep. I'm like, dude, he's going to see me. I have no shirt on. I'm like, you know, okay, what do I do? Let me look for a four-star hotel. There was, I think, a holiday. But those guys just drove off. They drove off. And funny, they went one mile ahead and they tried to burn the car. So you know that gas that was there? Uh, they they tried to burn the car. They failed to burn the car. They left the car there with all machine guns, everything inside. And they took another car and left. But do you think they were trying to burn it while you were inside it? No. Why do you think they didn't kill you? They would have killed me then and then if they wanted to. In the, okay. in the gym, when they saw yeah, yeah. me, if they wanted to kill me, they would have shot me. No, then. but at the end, because they realized they can't get, they're not getting any money. I don't think, just, because I think, you being alive, I think, yeah. is, is you're going to come after them. So there's parts of the puzzle that I cannot speak about. Okay. Uh, but it was, it was mercenaries that were hired to do this job. And uh, maybe the aim was to get money, but there was something larger than that. But in the end, maybe the, the, it didn't work out because of Allah's will, because of people's prayers. Alhamdulillah. And, you know, a lot of people played a big role. You know, I went to Georgetown University. Georgetown University has gone on the best school of foreign services in the world. So half of the State Department kids are from Georgetown. So I know that the, our university president reached out to this uh, State Department. So a lot of people helped. My neighbors who are ambassadors of Switzerland, they helped. A lot of people helped. But people's prayers, and that saved me, bro. But I have a question. Yes. So, the, like, uh, first of all, I, I think at that moment when you were inside the house, yeah, you would have given everything for your freedom, right? Would you, would you, if they told you, like, here's a check, it's your entire net worth, all your businesses, everything, would you sign it? Yes. Everything, yeah? My father, or my, my father would have done that he, he, he went and said it to many times that please leave my kid. I'll give you everything. Yeah. He said publicly. Yeah. Not publicly, in private conversations with some important people. He said, yeah, of course. I mean, what is more important than life? True. Yeah. And you're I mean, you can make your money again or you may not live a comfortable life, but yeah. And like you, you were saying that in, you, in the story that you held the guy's hand and you could tell he was Christian because you studied theology how? No, no, I, I studied theology and he was Christian. So, you know, the full time, there was one guy who was sitting with me the full time. They would not leave me alone. Now, they were getting bored, more two or three people living with me in a small room because they had a big house to them. So they would go out and hang out and have drinks or whatever it may be, and they would leave one guy. So this one guy was the only guy who was speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And I kept on telling him, you're a Christian faith. I've studied Christianity. What you're doing is haram. Don't do these things. What is wrong? Don't you have children? He's like, I have children. I'm like, dude, if the police comes here, you'll die. I'll die. I have children. You have children. We're all going to like be in a problem, you know? Yeah. So he's the guy I felt a little comfortable with around. You can console. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think he had probably something to do with them leaving you? I think there was an instruction that came, you know, that... Uh, An important person told them. Yeah. That Maybe like, someone outbid your bidder. No, I don't think so. I think there was no, uh, there was no outbidding of money. It was just, I think, God... I think God... Um, just decided to give me an extended life. But surely, like, okay, those people, they get caught? Whatever you can say, because I understand got that caught. nobody got caught. Nobody. Till now. Nobody. Wow. Publicly. That's why I'm telling you that there is a story to it. 
that is behind the story. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, that still it's called a paradox that something happened and then it was untangled and you could see it is untangled, but it is not clear. Let's leave it at that. Okay. All right, all right. That's wild. And about like the experience, um, terrible experience. Yeah. I will not wish it for my worst enemy. Yeah. You, 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 you're gone, boss. You're gone. It's, it's near death experience. How did your life like? So after, like, when you I was struggling to sleep. I had uh, a lot of nightmares. Did you have to go to therapy? I didn't go to a therapy as such, but yes, my family were telling me to go to therapists. You just said, let's just let me go back that. to work. Yeah, yeah. I, so I started working a few days after Same that. Same as the boardroom. Yeah, yeah. I had a few board meetings. I'm back in the game, baby. <laughs> let's talk some numbers. Show me the financials. Yeah. After a few days. It's yeah. Q4. <laughs> Q4, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, stop. but Alhamdulillah. God saved me, gave me so a new what, life. How, so from the, from the golf course, yeah. what was the plan of action? You had no then, phone. No, then I decided. So you had I, no phone, I, right? No, I had no phone. I was, and then, and then what I did, there was a European Union building. So I started running. It was night. It was two in the morning. So I, 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 I pinpointed a hotel, which was the closest public place. And I started running towards that. And then running came the European speed. Union building, and I realized there's a lot of security people there think, uh, with guns. Yeah. So I'm like, no, no, no. If I run here, so I was first nervous to talk to them. At the same time, I was nervous to cry, to run, because I thought they can shoot me. Because it's like, <laughs> what the hell, right? This guy's a thief or something, right? But do you think so they I'm knew you? I'm walking, and they are looking at me. Hey, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Where are you going, man? I'm like, dude, I'm more, man. <laughs> more they're, they're looking at me. You more, man? Where the hell have you been? You know, they, so one guy, suddenly five guys come in. Yeah, it's I, more. And yeah, it's more, man. What the hell? Where have you been? We've been looking for you. I'm like, yeah, me too, man. And then I look at them and they look at me and, and I'm like, okay, no problem. I'm just going to go to the hotel. No, no, no. We're coming with you. No, I'm getting scared because, because I'm, know like, I'm traumatized, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And no, they're like, no, 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 no. We're coming. We can't leave you now. And maybe they think they can steal from you now. And I told them, no, no, no. no. <laughs> they, 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 they're security guys. And I, you know, I told them, you'll get into trouble because the police will come in. Yeah, they're like, no, no, no problem. <laughs> Then they took me all the way to the hotel, oh, and I stayed in the hotel. I went there, and I called my dad and my, my uncle, my brother, and they were coming. Who was the first call? My dad. I called my dad, and the guy... From the hotel phone? He, he, I didn't call him. He called him. I gave him the number, and he said, look, Mo is here. So he, obviously, he's been getting all these red fake signals yeah, from a lot of here, people, you here. know, that the guys found. Him. Anyone who looked remotely like you, hey, I saw more there, yeah, I saw more yeah, walking yeah. on there. So this guy, you know, he, he immediately rushed. And while he was rushing, I was sitting. Your in, dad? Yeah, my dad and my, my brother. And I was sitting like in the main, you know, lobby of a hotel. And I'm like, no Chilling. shirt, no. And I'm like telling those guys, don't you think this is bad for your hotel? Because there were people who were checking in, you know? I'm like, what the hell? They're like, these Give Europeans were trying to check in and they're seeing that this guy is sitting here. I'm like, don't you think that I should go and sit somewhere else? They're like, no, no, no. Mo, they don't want to give you a room. go and use a you know, shower? I'm like, dude, I don't even have clothes. Where am I going to go? I don't want to shower. I want to go home. And then I told them to convince them to make me sit somewhere outside. But everybody was so nice, man. Everybody was so nice. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And then your dad came and what was the reaction? Yeah, they were just, they, they did sujood. They did sujood and everybody was praying and I went home. The police came and after that, you know, the police came and we chatted and, you know, and then they came and they did a lot of tests on me, you know. You were, so I, I assume probably got a lot of nightmares from that, no? Yeah. Every night. Yeah, yeah. I was getting PTSD. PTSD. I still do. I still do. Still do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you wake up and you think you're there. No, no, sometimes, yeah, I think I'm, I'm getting kidnapped or something like that, yeah. But, you know, to a large extent, um, uh, because of my prayers, God has treated me very well, alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's almost gone in my life now. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's something tough. that you can never tough, imagine tough, tough, like tough, happening tough, to you, tough, you know? Tough. Just split second, you're dead. Bro. And your whole life changes. Completely, after that. completely. Now I move around with police, security. Tail cars, yeah. Ten cars. Tail, tail cars. Tail cars. Tail cars. But yeah. probably like five, yeah, six Yeah, a lot, cars. lot of security people. Six, six security people full time, all with, you know. Straps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Serious. Equipped, equipped. Equipped, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Serious equipment. And I travel everywhere, 
I travel with security, man. Yeah. Life has changed. What was like the biggest learning lesson from you in that? Your silver lining was that I moved out of my very difficult work regimen and I spent more time with my wife, with my kids, and that's the most important, my family and my mom and my dad. This is the best thing. Because you realize what is important completely, at the moment. Completely. If, if, God forbid, of course, if you had passed away in that moment, mm. you would have felt like you didn't, you completely. never, you only, you only were doing, like you're only spending your time with work. You completely. Know? Completely. It was the biggest regret of my life. Yeah, because you were like, shit, like, damn, man. And then you realize, like, they, they're ready to give up everything for you, you know? Completely. And I spend now more time, I go on to walks with my wife, spend more time playing golf with my boys, yeah. see my daughter more often, you know? Alhamdulillah. I think I'm in a good space now. Yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah, man. Alhamdulillah. I don't know if you know that I've signed the Giving Pledge. The Giving Pledge is an initiative by... Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, they decided to get billionaires around the world to sign this pledge where billionaires give away half of their wealth to philanthropy. So I am one of the few Africans that have signed no and way. we are about 120, 130 billionaires in the world. Wow. We meet once in a year, always in the US, and we talk about philanthropy uh, and making sure that when we give, we have to bang for the buck. It's like when you want to invest, you want to invest and maximum, get the maximum yeah, yeah. return. Similarly, when we do philanthropy, so I have initiatives through the Modeuji Foundation. I do a lot of accessibility of water. And we'll talk about politics yeah. a little bit. That is what brought me into politics in the first place. Uh, children with cancer. I mean, the time when I started supporting these uh, initiatives, I think eight kids out of 10 were dying. Now we're down to two, two wow. and a half. Alhamdulillah. And then we do a lot of scholarships for education, uh, scholarships for universities. So I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time now, and that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Mm. Uh, initiatives for philanthropy. So money is important, but is not the most important uh, variable in happiness. Mm. Crazy, but uh, that's very fascinating. You said so many things I want to ask you about. So, fifty yeah. percent of your income when you pass away will go to charity. Yes, fifty percent. Yes, wow. I will. That's I will, I, and I'm already more. started to give it away from now. So, and I've pledged fifty percent of my wealth that will go away. Wow, yes. your, your kids must be upset though. Not really, not really. I think I still <laughs> think they'll have enough money. Yeah, 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 yeah. enough to go yes, out. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's wild. Um, yeah. So 120 people like you have yes. have agreed to that. So yes. that's going to be like billions and billions of dollars. Right, right. With that, do you think? Because that, like, at least at minimum, that's 120 billion dollars. Or, or something minimum, like more, yeah. more, more, more. Yeah, I mean, you minimum, look at you know? like likes of Bill Gates. Yeah, it's already going to reach. I mean, that this alone. guy, I think, already uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think his budgets are about eight, ten billion already wow. a year. So he's doing a fantastic job, you know. And I and you meet this great group of people. Uh, we sit down and we discuss philanthropy and whoever, and there's no soliciting, asking someone to join you. No, if you have interests that are aligned, you work together. Otherwise, you go in your separate ways. And for example, me, Africa is the closest to my heart. I mean, I have made money in Africa and I want to do a lot more philanthropy in Africa. Yeah. Nice, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. So yeah, do you think like with that, at least like let's say 200, 300 billion mm. that they have, do you think they'll be able to like, you know, let's say finally find a cure to cancer or like end world hunger or something, I think so. something like that. I think so, because if you look at Bill, I was speaking to him, he was telling me he has almost ended polio. Wow. With the funding that he's giving, I think there are very few more cases left in the world. And his initiative was to eliminate polio. He's going to eliminate polio. Wow. Yeah, so... They can make huge life changes. Big time, well, big yeah. time, big time. And they are good people, you know. Um, so, you know, and, you know, also religion gives us a lot of strength in making sure that we help people. Mm. So, alhamdulillah, that gives you a lot of satisfaction. And, you know, coming back to your question, you must have realized you talk about being rich and being happy. You have incidents of happiness or times of happiness. When you buy a new watch, right, mm. you will feel happy, right? Dopamine. So, like, for how long? Short term. Short term. Right? Yeah. After that, what happens? You don't care anymore. Right? Yeah. So, so 
it's not like sat- actual satisfaction or like um, actual like fulfillment. So, so the question is, somebody who does not have the watch that you have may think that, oh, you're saying that because you already have that watch. But now you understand what I'm yeah, saying, right? Because I'm already thinking about another watch. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, man, that's crazy. Yeah. But sometimes, yeah, it, it takes you to get it to realize yeah. you didn't need it. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about uh, how I got into politics. So when I graduated from university in 1999, 98, 99, I went back. And because I was born in Singida, Singida is about 700 miles away from Dar es Salaam. And my grandfather was buried there. My great grandfather Mm -hmm. was buried there. As you know, I'm originally Indian that have migrated to East Africa in the late 1800s. So we have no connectivity to India as such. Uh, I mean, I can speak Gujarati and stuff, but the problem is that we have grown up and lived all our lives in Tanzania. So we're Tanzanians. And when I went there, I, 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 while I was, I went there to recite Fatia for my grandfather's grave, etc. And I was born there. And you know, the town is a peri-urban town. It's a town with periphery that are rural. So in, 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 in the town, you have power, you have water, proper town. But when you go uh, out 5, 10 kilometers, you hit rural. So I, I, while I was exploring, I met an old man. And he was kneeling down, and there was a puddle of yellow water. And he had a bucket, and he had a plate. What he was doing is he was taking the plate and taking water from the puddle. You could see this is contaminated water, and he was putting it into the... Bucket, And I'm saying that, uh, greetings, how are you, sir? I started speaking to him in Kiswahili, and I told him that, what are you doing? He said, this is the water that I'm drinking and my children are drinking. So, I mean, I came from the U.S. I'm like, no, this is not real, right? You, he could see it from my face that I didn't believe him. Yeah. So he told me, no, why don't you come to my house? I went to his shack, and I realized that kids were drinking this water, yellow water, in used PET bottles. When I left, I started doing research that, you know, people are getting sick with waterborne disease, and I I realized three out of ten kids got waterborne disease were dying. Now, why they were dying? One, because they had poor education. So when they got sick, the healthcare centers were far, and they were treating it locally. So out of bad education, bad health care, no accessibility of water, kids who are dying. Now, I have children, brother, and I love my children. And I know every parent loves their child the way I love mine. Mm. You cannot tell me that a child that lives in Dubai or a child living in New York, his or her right. life is, is worth more than a child from Tanzania. So when I asked that old man, who's your member of parliament? He said the member of parliament is the minister of water. Now, you know, to be minister, you have to be a member of parliament. MP, yeah. And to be minister, you need to be appointed by the president. Okay. So I went back home and I told my dad, I want to be an MP. I want to run against this minister. My father's like, listen, man, Relax. we're entrepreneurs. You know, don't, don't fight with this government. government. You're, not, you're not African. That's a, that's a, yeah, so but, that's but I'll tell you, as much as I may not be indigenous African, but if you see my pictures and my rallies, I've never felt like a second-class citizen oh, okay, in, 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 in Tanzania. So I, I did run for parliament, and I did become a member of parliament. I ran six elections in a span of 15 years, six elections that I won all of them. Wow. And I became a member of parliament. I became a national executive committee member. And uh, I education from 23%, we jumped it up to 80 odd percent. Accessibility of water went to 88%. We healthcare centers. This is while you were running the businesses? Yes, while. While I was running. How? It was crazy because I I remember remember the parliament was 500 kilometers away. Oh, no. And the constituency was 700 kilometers away. And initially, I used to drive. used to take me 16 hours to get there. And then I started chartering planes. I had some weird experiences with those chartered planes also. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, but all in all, it was really good. It was something. And at night, I would go during the day and visit all my projects that I'm doing. At night, I have 1,000 people that want to meet me one-on-one. One-on-one. And they are poor people. They are sick people. 
who want me to help them. And some, they lie, but they are poor. Yeah. You know, yeah. someone will say that somebody is sick. Maybe they are not sick, but they are poor. They are poor. You can and tell. I would sit and I would meet them from 7 in the evening till 4 o'clock in the morning. What? Every single one of them, I would meet them. What? Yes. yes. But was that your duty as the MP? You had to? I, I mean, your job as a member of parliament is to make legislation go to parliament, not to but you. also your people. Yeah. Right? So it was not a direct job of mine, but I would still, I mean. You felt the necessity. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It, yeah, yeah. That's why. So it was amazing. Yeah. So when I to, when I came back to you know re-election, I would never do campaigning or anything, you know, and I would just win. Yeah. Because the people trusted me. We had a very good uh, relationship. You don't need to do marketing if the people like you. Right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Very much so. But th those are good, good times, change. you know, good experience. Would I do that again? No. Would I get into politics again? No. No president. I'm done. No, I'm done. President. No way. No way. Not interested. Tanzania even has even an African uh, female president for the first yeah, time. Yes, so she's amazing. Uh, president Samia Sulu Hassan. She's doing a fantastic job. You know, has brought back Tanzania into the world uh, map. Yeah, she's uh, helpful to the investors that come from abroad. Very she even much did a so. movie, I think, recently. Like yes. there's like a movie about Tanzania. So she she's she's done the royal uh, tour. The royal tour. Yeah, so yeah. so the Serengeti, the Ngorongoro, the Zanzibar. So that's where the island is. I have the island in Zanzibar. Wow. Yes, nice. yes. It's a beautiful island. It's about three hundred and fifty acres. And uh, I'm going to put up a resort there, wow, and I'm nice. going to build uh, a second holiday homes, and I'll build my own house there also. Nice. Yes, yes. Nice. When yes. is that going to be ready? I, we are starting the project sometime this year. We're just trying to get the environment impact assessments done. Okay. Uh, it's, 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 the island is called Pungume. It's in the south of uh, Zanzibar. It's just 15 minutes by boat. Okay. Yes. So... I want to ask you then, you know, yeah. every time you yeah. start talking, yes. I get a million questions, you yes. know? Yes, yes. And I don't know where to like start because yes. it's, it's so interesting that like, each yes. time you start talking, there's yes. a new interesting thing that I find out that I want to ask you about. Like, right. I feel like each point you mention every 10 right. minutes could be extracted into its own, right. like a uh, podcast of its own. But right. anyways, with the little time we have, yes. I want to ask you, you know, um, being, I don't know if you're still the youngest billionaire in Africa, or that's what you've been called. Mm. And I don't know if you're still that anymore till today. However, my question is, this is different from every other billionaire because it's, it's much easier to become a billionaire when your company gets valued at $10 billion and you own 10% of it. But with your company, it's not based on a, it's not based on like a public... Um, so you never got like... So this is my question. Did you receive like fundings and like investments and that made the valuation larger, number one? Number two, would you guys ever go public like IPO, stock market or anything like that? Like the other competitors that you deal with, such as let's say Cola or whatever. That's number two. And yeah, like how, who valuated the company, your companies or your... So basically valuations of companies are based, like you said, publicly listed companies. And they are either depending on what kind of businesses they run. Some yeah. are being valued on price to earning ratios. Some revenue, are being, yes, multiple. on revenue multiples. Some are being valued on EBITDA multiples. Yeah. I think we get valued, not that we get valued very high, we get valued with our so-called competitive peers. Uh, Market share. Those that are trading publicly, so they would kind of value you ah, similarly, okay, number okay. one. Number two, I own majority of the business. That's uh, only you. Yeah, and... Um, and I have two younger brothers who are also with me uh, in the business. Uh, one is doing human resources, one is doing marketing. And um, so I think, you know, I mean, we, I mean, growing the business was difficult because I remember when I got back from university, I had to borrow money to grow. Yeah. And a Barclays bank had a ca paid up capital of $10 million and they could lend you $2 million at oh, that time. So I realized I'm never going to be able to grow Nowadays, uh, you can do like Series A, like make a PowerPoint with some cool people in USA and take like 20 million. 20 million, right? So I started going and borrowing in South Africa. So a lot of my growth came because of debt. I, and the debt, basically the interest rates were low. So I benefited out of a lot of trust that banks had in me so all and banks. had my plans. No, no, like zero. venture capital. VCs, zero venture capital, zero 
uh, what uh, PE, I, 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 I don't touch price, uh, what PE funds, I think the valuations are terrible. Uh, yes, to answer your question, I will take METL public. Really? And we have a plan, yeah, in the next seven years that we have a plan to take it public. Seven years. Then I will retire. Damn. That's my last chapter of my life. I don't know, bro. Yes. I feel like it's going to be hard for you to retire. No, bro. no, really. really. Yeah. I will, I will. Seven I will. years. I'm going gonna, gonna to come back to you Yes, seven years. yes, yes. I'm 48. We'll do a yacht trip. By the time 55, I'm done. You know? You've said that. Yes, yes, yes. Then I will go buy a few hundred million dollar yacht and then spend time on the yacht. <laughs> nice. you know? And you invite me? <laughs> yeah, of, course, okay, of, course, good, of course, of course, of course. As long as I'm there, it's fine. Yes, no of course. So, but of I course. like how you plan. Like, so yes. seven years, 10 years, yes. you always have plans like years. For and sure, months. for sure. You, nothing comes without planning, my friend. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You need to orchestrate a time uh, and you have to plan. Uh, not always your plan will go as per your, your thought, but sometimes you run into trouble in between, you recarve. But you need to have a plan of where you're heading, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think about these modern entrepreneurs? Like when I heard your, you say your day, I mean, I like that you start with exercise. I think that's the best thing. You know, I think definitely that has something to do with the success you have, has something to do with that, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you exert that much effort and stuff. But what about the other things that people do in the day-to-day -day routines, especially these new entrepreneurs with all this like meditation and gratitude journaling and affirmations. They have like sometimes two hour, two hour long morning routines with like steps, do you think all that is like useful or is it better just wake up and work? No, no, no. I think that it is, exercise is very important because what happens is that it's, it's just important for your metabolism, important for your body, Confidence. important also, they say a healthy body is a healthy mind. Yeah. Important for your sleep. Mm -hmm. So I think important for your discipline. discipline. Even when I was young, my father used to always push us to play golf and tennis, like at professional level. Yeah. So we would go out and train and train and train. And he would rather us get tired and go to sleep than go out at night. Yeah. So I think any type of exercise for an hour that's rigorous is key to anyone's success, mm -hmm. number one. Uh, number two, look, some people like to do Pilates and yoga and so on and so forth. I like to, I, I mean, I'm a Muslim. I pray five times a day. I feel, Mashallah. yeah, I feel that when I pray to Allah, I feel very close. I feel that's my meditation. I think that is where I release my stress. I speak to my Lord and, I, and that creates a lot of comfort. And it also reminds me that, you know, life is short. Anything we can sit here and plan for 10 years and I can get out and be banged with a car and die, right? So it is always very, very important to reflect mm -hmm. on your life and that what happens if you die? And as you said, that I've gone through a near-death experience. So I very much accept that, that anything can happen to anyone at any time. So let us not wait that when I will become X years old, I will do Y, or when I become 60 and I'll become 70. We may not live to be 70. The other day, a friend of mine is telling me, Mo, you're 48, you're middle-aged. So I told him, really? I mean, why do you say middle-aged? I don't think I'm middle-aged. And, and I asked him that, how many 96-year-old do you know? Mm, true. And he says, not many. So yeah. I'm like, it's not middle age. It's like three quarters. It's downhill, bro. It's almost done. You know <laughs> no, what I'm saying? No, no, I'm no, telling no, you. No, yeah, I'm <laughs> telling you, you may think otherwise. You know, the reality is it's done. You know, and now it's between you and your God. But you're so healthy, bro. Show, I'm going to show you guys a picture more. There's a man has almost a six pack. <laughs> so I don't think so, bro. Yes, I think yeah. you, I think you, if anyone's going to be that 96 year old running around, it's going to be you. Inshallah, bro. inshallah. Inshallah. So basically, 120 billionaires who have all pledged to give away 50% of their wealth, they all meet up in one place. How does that kind of meeting look like? And is it like kind of like you guys are at a club? Do you have like a group chat of billionaires? Billionaire we don't group have chat? a group chat, but we all meet and then we all uh, sit down and we discuss our individual philanthropic journeys. We share uh, and then there are areas of interest that come through. Is it like a hotel or what is it like? A yeah, I mean, it depends. It's area. To, I mean, sometimes in the West Coast, sometimes in the East Coast. But it is, it is, it's very well known. It's called the Giving Pledge. And uh, we, we meet and yes, of course, there's high security, of course. 
nobody can go in and come out of that hotel. Like how many people can you bring with you? Nobody. You can just, you don't go. It's no plus the, one. No, you, you, you can go with your wife. That's it. That's wife. it. Yes. So I usually take uh, my wife and sometimes I travel with someone there to stay in the hotel. They, they don't come out. Yeah, and there has to be a proper vetting system. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, how does the conversation go? Nothing. You can talk to anybody. They're such friendly people, good people. But no one's trying to benefit of like, this. It's not, it's not know, networking. No, no, no. No soliciting. No, said. no soliciting. No soliciting. But good people, good environment, and you get to learn so much. Yeah. Yeah. Humble people. Yeah. Is Bill, um, are you close with Bill or like Warren Buffett? Yes. No, no. Bill, no, Warren now, the last few years, I haven't met him. He's become quite uh, old, huh? Yeah. But uh, Bill's a great guy. I think, you know, he's a guy that will be remembered for many, many he gets you know, some weird publications online. Like yes. he has a weird, like, like a lot of controversial, um, a lot of, sorry, con- controversy, uh, those um, controversy theorists, you know, they make, they always like come up with new I stuff. I think, you know what, you know, a, every successful person that tries to do good in this world, there are always people that are trying to put him down and conspiracy theorists, yeah. you know, are always there. I'm sure there are people... Uh, talking a lot about conspiracy about my life also, but but I'm telling you firsthand, he's a good man. He's someone that I respect. He has a good heart. Someone that spends tons of money on philanthropy and that wants to make uh, this world a better place. That I guarantee you. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about like COVID, dude? <laughs> COVID, COVID was a mess, man. I mean, uh, at times you know people are thinking that everybody's gonna die. And uh, and I do. I took like I think I think I took six injections, dude. Six yeah. injections. Yeah, because I took. But surely you get them now. No, no, no. But I took five. Uh, first, I took the the the, the Chinese. So Chinese one apparently was just like an immune booster. It wasn't like a live vaccine. I have no idea. Yeah. I was just taking. <laughs> Nobody had any idea because there wasn't yeah. enough time to actually. So I took Pfizer either. and then I took again double <laughs> Pfizer and I took the. You're I never got COVID, dude. I'm sure I must have got COVID, but I didn't, didn't know. Feel it, yeah. But Even I tested me, I so many times. I never so tested positive. Yeah. So I used to go out. So you know, Tanzania never went into a lockdown. Yeah, the the ex president he didn't believe in it. Yes. I apparently like he tested um like a, a mango and he tested goats and like. The goat would come out positive and he'd be like, Look, this goat has COVID. It's a hoax. This mango has, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So that was true. He was doing yes, that. Yeah, it's true. And then apparently true. he died by COVID. That I cannot say uh, off record. Yeah. But um, apparently, like, according to news articles, yeah, I read. So at that time, you know, Tanzania never went into a lockdown. So I used to go and watch these big Simba games and there'd be crazy amounts of people. No mass, nothing. No, nothing. And then <laughs> we would come home and my wife was in Tanzania. And then she flew to Dubai, and when she flew in here at the airport, she tested positive. So she was so pissed off at me. She's like, you're the one who's given me this COVID because of all your football, and you're going out and mingling, and so on and so forth. And good thing was, two days later, I was flying into Dubai, and I tested negative. You know? So then you're and like, she still, me. she still kept on saying I gave her the COVID. <laughs> and while she was coughing... I was inside the room. I was the only one. She, everybody was like staying away from her. Didn't I was care. the only one. I was just there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think looking back, like, I think people realized, like, it was not something that was as much of a threat for people in our age with our immune system as we thought it might, might have been. A lot of people died also. Huh? But our age? No, our age, no. But a lot of elderly people yeah. died. But arguably, people who would have passed away around the, that year or the year after, anyways, no? I don't know, man. Some people looked. Way too healthy to pass really, away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That you know personally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people, I think maybe there was also a little bit of a worry. Which, which exacerbated yeah, the, the sickness. Yeah, yeah. I think people died because of the worry. Mm. Yeah, also. That's, a, that's a very good theory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the worry just makes it worse, like the right. placebo effect. Right, correct, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, I want to brief quickly, like two, three questions mm-hmm. and finish. Mm-hmm. Because one thing that's on everyone's mind, you know, with all these traditional businesses, mm. everyone's talking now about one thing, which is AI. Mm. Do you think that's where the future is? How are you incorporating AI in your business? Or do you not care about AI and this new I wave? Think, I think AI is the future. I think the ra- last revolution was the internet. This revolution is AI. Not I crypto? Think, no. <laughs> I think we should invest our time, our energy, our money. I think it's going to be revolutionary. I think... That's where the next bunch of billionaires are going to come from. 
Et euh, hein? The faster you join the bandwagon, the faster you move on to it, the faster you adopt it to your business, the more successful you're going to be. Trust me, I have a lot of friends in the US. If you're not going to jump into the bandwagon, you will be, remain far behind. So what's like, what's the actual steps? Like just look online for AI companies, just apply to every company you find. I think that you first have to understand the technology behind the LLMs. AI. Yes. Then after that, you have to see how it can help or bring efficiency in your specific line of work or business. And three, you should look at how fundamentally it can change uh, business models in the world and where you can get profit out of. And then you can co-invest into them. And I think, I mean, you will get crazy valuations to come, yeah. I believe, 100%. Yeah, they're already getting crazy valuations. Yes, yes. and it's going to get crazy. Are you incorporating AI in your business? For sure. For sure. We're spending a lot of time doing that. We're using technology for sure. You know, today I'll give you a small example mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence. Today, debt is the biggest instrument for growth in the world. I mean, today you have credit cards. In America, you have credit cards. In Africa, people don't have credit cards. How do you lend money to someone who has no credit reference bureau or has no security? So, for example, you go in, let's say it's Mohammed. I go into a system, and I go into my own system, I want to borrow $100. So, okay, where do I work? I work in JLT. Okay, where do I live? I live in Emirates Hills. If I'm lying, the system will catch that, no, 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 no. I don't drive from Emirates Hills to JLT. Um, because whoever, whichever tower I communicate with, mm. eh, it will come, the AI will pick it up. If you had a magic ball, and you could ask it any question, what would you ask it? It could tell you the truth about anything you want in life. Like when you're such such person is going to pass away or when what's the future of your life or what should you do? Or you can ask it one question, magic crystal ball, any question, a truth about yourself, about anything. What are you asking it? When am I going to die? Okay. Yeah. So you can prepare for it? Yes. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Yes. That makes sense. It's a good question. All right, next question. If you could pick one thing, power, money, or fame, which one? I would pick humility. That's not an option. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of, all of it uh, gives you a lot of pompous. So I, I, I would really pray for humility. Humility? Yes. Okay. Uh, not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> but it's fine. We'll move on. Um, has there ever been a time you wish that nobody knew? That like nobody knew more? Like you might, there's a time you might just turn off all your social medias and just go? Very much so. Really? All the time. Really? Uh, yeah, all the time. It's so difficult, you know, whenever I go out and have lunch and dinner. And I'm a guy who can never say no to take pictures with people and it's so complicated everywhere you go. So I love it sometimes the United Arab Emirates. I can be wearing my shorts and wearing my sunglasses and undercover. I love it. Yeah. I love it, man. Yeah. So do you yeah. think there'll be a time where you delete all your social medias and just love it, man. You do it? I love to be unknown. Yeah. Undercover. Undercover. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, how do you select your friends and do you feel like your personal friend group that everyone just wants to be with you because you're more Delji? Yeah. For sure, you know, you, I, I, first, I'm too old to make new friends. No uh, new friends. No new That's friends. That's a rule. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, there are people that we have similar interests, uh, people that we work together. We are friends. Uh, and I have friends that I've grown up with. Your day ones. Yes, and they, they are, I'm, I'm very comfortable around them. And I know that we have that genuine alignment. Because together. it was before you had anything. For sure. Yeah, and how many close close friends would you say you have? Because if when I hear your life story yes. and your day-to-day -day routine, it yes. seems like your life is a bit lonely. Right. I think am it I correct in saying that? I think so. I think I am an introvert. I've become more of an introvert over time. I have maximum four friends that I am hundred percent comfortable around, and I can spend a lot of time with them. And how often do you see them? One hand seen for many years. Wow. I went and spent some time with him in the boat. Um, maybe after 10 years, wow. and, uh, and, but he's a nice guy. And I usually see them at least once in a year, twice in a year. But that's it. Yeah, that's it. But they are only close I people. I know, I need to spend more time. <laughs> There's a new resolution. Yeah, yes. <laughs> 2024. Yes. All right, okay. Um, has there been a time where the money negatively impact your relationships, like your friends or family, like the money negatively impacted something incident? For sure, for sure. You know, when uh, you're wealthy, you have money, uh, Everybody around you feels they're entitled. Mm, where's my share? Where's my share? So you can have a f 
far-fetched friend. You can have a close family member. I gave you my pencil in fifth grade. I lent you my pencil. Same, very much so. So it, it does become difficult at times. What do you do in those yeah. situations? Just I try. Them? I try to help as much as I can. And then I leave it to God. And then, you know, what's, I'm, I'm okay with it in my heart. If somebody feels bad, good luck to them. But I would do the best that I can. Mm, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, you can't make everyone happy. Oh, yes, the Bugatti story. So you bought a Bugatti, yes. a carbon fiber Bugatti, but yes. you never posted it online. No, yeah. this is a secret. This is probably the first time. Is this the first time you're ever announcing it publicly? Yes, the first, first time. time. So I bought a Bugatti. And then I realized sure. when I went and saw it, and I'm like, dude, I'm not driving a four and a half million euro car. Uh, it's just too fast. Did you, you try driving it? No, no. I, I went to see it. Uh, and then I realized, no, 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 no. I don't <laughs> think I can afford to buy a, or drive a 4.5 million But you already were car. buying it at the time. I know. So I sold it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I okay. sold it off, yeah. How long did you keep yeah. it for? I think I kept it for maybe three, four months. And you didn't have temptation to drive it one no, time? No, I didn't. I didn't. But you're not a big car guy. I'm not a big car guy. I'm so you didn't guy. sit in the front seat? No, I, I didn't even sit. I didn't even turn it on. I promise. Really? I swear I promise. I just never could imagine that there is cars in this world that are north of 4 million, 5 million. But what's 4, mi four 5 million for you? I know. For you, it's like, that's like a day. <laughs> No, as, as, but, but I would rather... Like even if you totaled it, it would be like two days and you get it back No, no, no. I would rather, I think, I would rather give that money to uh, some place where it has a bigger impact in life okay. yeah, than me driving it. And yes. did you sell it for more money? Yeah, I did. I, I think I made 500,000 euros or something. Wow. Yes. And with that 500,000 euros, I have bought few uh, water rigs to drill wells in Africa. Wow, mashallah. Yes, yes. Nice. Alhamdulillah. That's I crazy. made that Nia. Nice. Yes, yes. With the profit you made. But you know, I think yes. you're the only yes. person in the world to buy a Bugatti Chiron and make a profit on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> insane. It's I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I had a good intention. Honestly, yeah. yeah. It's good, it's good. Yeah, Sounds good, man. Alhamdulillah. Um, what's your biggest strength? Discipline. Discipline. Your biggest yeah. weakness? Yes. Biggest with this is also discipline, because <laughs> I'll tell you why. Yeah, it's overdoing things may not be as good sometimes. Mm. So it's my strength and also my weakness. Sometimes I overdo it. So your is willpower good. is crazy strong. Crazy strong. Like you can tell yourself today you're gonna run 50 kilometers. You and I will run. It. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You wouldn't be able. How no. did you train it or was it like that? No, no, no. It's over time. It's, it's, it's wanting and 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 you 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 control it and you get better at it. Yeah. So now you wish you toned it down a little bit so it could be easier on yourself. For sure, for sure. <laughs> but you can't, it's too late. No, no, but you, you can, I, at least I'm getting to a point where it's not really bad. I can tone it down. Has there ever been a time you woke up one day and just decided I'm not going to do anything today? Yes. Nothing productive? Yes. I've, I, so I, the last time I went to the boat, um, I was just chilling. I was hibernating and, you know, my wife was wondering what the hell's wrong with not you. Not even a call? No, nothing. And I said, I'm not speaking to anybody <laughs> today in the whole world phone. yeah 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 so it's just listening i'm sure that day when you checked your phone you saw bill gates <laughs> <Warren Buffett. laughs> i was like hey mo where's going on oh like the biggest people in the world yeah macron yeah. um how could someone with no money today start making money you know i'll tell you that money should not be the ultimate aim one we have to understand that first there's no free money in this world yeah nobody is going to give you any money for free number one number two with success there's no escalator, there's no elevator, boss. You have to climb the stairs. And you have to climb one by one by mm. one. Unless if you want to go and, you know, cheat someone lottery or, or rob a bank or get a lottery or something, you know. Otherwise, it's a step by step. So let's get the reality to sink into us that making money is a process and uh, we need to be patient and we need to be disciplined. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Cool. Um, are you afraid of death? No. You could die and be fine. Alhamdulillah. You know, I am, I'm, every day I'm preparing more and more for it. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yes. We're going to end this right here. Yes. If you could tell one thing to your 19-year-old version of yourself, you're sitting, you're speaking to 19-year-old version Mo, he's right in front of you. Right. What would you tell him? Looking back, after all these years, you know? Yes. I would, I would tell my 19-year-old Mo, that there is much more to life than only money. Uh, and that 
don't waste your life only chasing after money. Uh, because that is my regret. Mm. Yeah. But let me challenge you a yeah. little bit on yes, that. Please. What I think is, yes. this is my theory, yes. and I, I think people have spoken about it. Mm. Society pays you in money for how much value you add to it mm. and how good you are at doing something. Mm. So the only way you make a lot of money is by adding a lot to society or solving a problem for society that so society pays you for it in money. Yes. Like, you know, you solve a certain stress or a certain time constraint or a certain problem of someone else. Okay. Okay. So do you not think that the more money you, you amass or the more money you make is the most you've done for your society? I think, yes, what you say does complement. But I think ultimately uh, what one should be very careful of is that greed... Uh, greed takes you in another level, you know, and that as long as you can control your greed, uh, then I think you're in a good place. And that money should not be the driving force. It's like what you rightly said, if you're trying to create value, then while creating value, the money will fall. Automatically. Forward. But if you have money front decked, mm. then there's a problem. Mm. Yes. Okay. And do you think at now at one point eight billion dollars, yes. you're, 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 it's enough, or I'm are trying you trying to, for hundred billion? I'm, I'm trying to hustle for sure. <laughs> you know, my next target I is think ten billion. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm hustling. I mean, I'm hustling, but not. I'm not hustling for the money. It's yeah. It's it's something. I'm opening a new chapter in my life. Uh, there's a big technology company that I'm investing in. A lot to do with uh, AI wow. algorithms. We're going to hear and, about it soon. Uh, yes, and we uh, will take that company public, and I'm looking at it to go north of 10 billion. Wow. But am I being driven by the value? Not really. I'm driven by the interesting thing I'm about to deliver in my second chapter you enjoy of my it? life. Yes. You enjoy it? Yes. Fully? Yes. Nice. That's yes. the main thing yes. then. Yes. yes. Yeah. 10 billion. We're going to come back to this clip. Mo's right now, 1.8 billion, yeah. 10 billion soon. 10 billion. Next, next podcast at 10 billion. Inshallah. Okay, but you said that when you add a certain amount of money, let's yeah. say you said, you said if you weren't happy at 10 million, you yeah. won't be happy with 1 billion. That's yeah. what you said. Yeah. Yeah. At what point is a good amount enough, uh, like a, enough money to have? How much money is enough money? Like, is 10 million where you decide, okay, now I should be happy? Because I know, if, I would say, okay, if you're making, making $1,000 a month, it's not enough. Don't be happy. <laughs> so what amount <laughs> would you say is like, okay, now... Be happy. Can I tell you something? So everybody used to say 10 million used to be a good Bench value. Mark. But I'll tell you something funny. I met a friend of mine and he told me, Mo, I have 10 million. What do you think? <laughs> so I'm like, dude, that's a lot of money. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the hell, hell yeah. He's like, but I heard 20 million is the new 10 million. <laughs> inflation. And I started laughing. You know, I'm like, you're crazy, dude. <laughs> so but I, it yeah, is dude, true with inflation. inflation. No, man. With inflation, I, 10 I, million, I, when I, that I, news came out. I think 10 out, million is a lot of money. 10 million <laughs> is a lot of money, yeah. I think. Yeah. You can do private jet. You can you can charter. Like, I don't think your lifestyle changes much. Like, you may no, own the million, thing. You can't have a private jet, bro. No, I'm saying you can charter it. You can charter it. Yeah, yeah. so your lifestyle doesn't change. It's just that instead yeah. of charging it, you own it. But yeah. when you, but you're, it's the same thing. You're in a private jet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So 10 million? 10 million is good, right, yeah, yeah. Fine, I'll keep that. I was, I was going to do like a billion, but now that you said that, I'll, say I'll, just, I'll end that. I'll, I'll cut it short. I was going to, but like, you know, Inshallah. based on your advice. All right. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Bro. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wish you all the best.